Blue Chew is making waves by bringing more confidence to the bedroom with their chewable tablets that will help you last longer and stay stronger in bed. Does this sound too good to be true? Well, guess what? You can try it for free. Just pay $5 in shipping by going to bluechew.com and entering code HOLLY to get your first month subscription. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have a very special guest. I have the motherfucking legendary, the one and only Amber Lynn. Amber, hi. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Holly. How you doing? Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I know. I am so excited about this interview. Um, I really love talking to people who you know, are veterans of the industry who have so much insight like you do, who used to work with my mom, because it's always really cool to kind of have this like full circle. And I love hearing experiences of people who, you know, worked with her back in the day when she was doing her thing as Suze Randall. So I'm really thrilled to have you here. And um, I know you have a lot of stories for us and I can't wait to get into it. Tons and tons of stories. And yes, I did work with your mom back in the day. And uh, she was a great pillar of um, of my success in the industry, I'll say. I learned a lot from her. And also, um, I have a little story before we start about you. Uh, Ooh, I, I love stories about me. Congratulations <laughs> on your show and the success of it. It's totally awesome. And it's really great to see what you've done with your show and everything that you're doing these days. I remember um, you when I was working with your mom and you were just, God, you were just a young girl. You must have been, I hope I'm not dating myself too much. You're probably about eight eight or nine years old. And I was over at your mom's studio and I was editing photos or picking up internet. And it was one of the times out of like probably a hundred times I worked with your mother. And all of a sudden I turned around and here's this little blonde girl standing outside of the studio. I think you had your, you had a little brother with you, a little blonde brother. You had these big blonde, gorgeous curls. You were this little matter of fact hand on her hip. Who are you? And I turned around and I said, Suze, is that your, she said, that's my Holly. I said, oh my God. I said, she's so beautiful. I said, she's all the best parts of you guys. And she said, yes, I'm very proud of her. So I don't know if you remember that, but I do. And that was what I thought of immediately when you got a hold of me to do the interview. So it's a pleasure to be here. How cool. How cool. So, um, let's get into it because I just know that you have, you know, we have so much material to get through and we have a limited amount of time. So why don't you start off by telling us how you got into the industry? Well, uh, I was, I was originally from Orange County, um, Orange, California, Southern California girl. I grew up, uh, with a whole lot of brothers and um my family was i'm gonna say they were they would have been very conservative both my parents passed away when i was young i was in a very traumatic car accident with my mother when i was about seven years old and it had a huge impact on me when i was young and um I also lost my father a few years later. So I grew up with a whole pack of brothers and my brothers were kind of these wild kids from the neighborhood and they had car clubs and they were in, 
it was, I guess you would call it like a street gang. It was a car club gang and all their friends used to hang around with them and they were older than me. They were about eight years, 10 years older than me. And I was just this little kid, kind of how I just explained you, you know, just a little kind of eight, nine year old girl. I was always looking at these older kids and they had these hot muscle cars my brother had like a 69 Camaro. One of them had a Chevelle, all these really hot cars. And I would look at them and go, wow, I want to be just like them when I grow up. So uh, as I started to grow up, I started hanging out at the Orange County Raceway with my brothers and their muscle cars. So in the beginning, I started doing modeling, like bikini modeling, hot body modeling, stuff like that. I would model for the cars and go to the speedway and uh, take pictures in front of the cars and bikinis, stuff like that. And it was definitely not, uh, my focus was not that I was going to be an adult star. I did want to be in magazines and I went to modeling school and I did like some commercials, some jean commercials when I was young but it was pretty light. Um, as I was coming up to Orange County with some friends of mine, we used to come up on the weekends and see bands play. And this was right when like Motley Crue and um, these kind of punk rock bands like TSOL, and they were all popularized down in the Orange County area. So we thought we were just cool as shit. And we would come up on the weekends and we would go in to see these bands. And I had a fake ID. Many of us did. We had fake IDs to be able to get into some of the clubs to see these bands. And one of the places that we would go after we would go see these bands is we would go to the Rainbow afterwards. Now, you had to be 21 to get into the Rainbow and because in the bar part but I had a fake ID. So one day I was um, up at the Rainbow. We had been to see one of the bands. I can't remember which one. And somebody walked up behind me and tapped me on the shoulder. And it was Clive McLean. Now, Clive was the senior photographer at the time for Hustler Magazine. He was this really adorable English guy. And he wasn't very tall. And he said, hey, darling, you're so beautiful. You should be in magazines. And I was like, well, I am a model. And he goes, why don't you come over to our table? So I walked to the back of the rainbow and they had this whole table, sat down with Clive. And he started telling me, he said, have you ever done nude, nude photographs before? And I was like, no, I don't shoot nudes. You know, the whole conversation. All of a sudden, this woman walks in, and it was Althea Flynn, and she came into the Rainbow. She was with, I think it was Lawn Friend, and there were some other people there. They all sat down. The first time I ever saw Althea Flynn, all I, I thought of her like as like a Joan Jett essence, and I was just, you know, really looking at them. They said, yeah, you should shoot for Hustler. And I was like, Hustler? I didn't even know what Hustler was. I had to like go and, and go, what, what is Hustler Magazine? And so I had not actually seen at the time an actual Hustler centerfold. But when I was booking um, my photo shoots and stuff like that, I had been offered to shoot for Penthouse. So I said to them, well, you know, if somebody offered to shoot me for Penthouse, and they were, as soon as Clive heard me say that, he was like, we have to have you for Hustler. So Althea chimed in and said, oh, you don't want to shoot for that old magazine. You should shoot for <laughs> Hustler. We're the best and all this stuff. And so I was really impressed. And um, that was kind of how it began. They said, why don't you come up, check out the magazines and stuff like that. So I wound up coming up to Los Angeles and then started shooting with Clive. He did a test on me. Um, 
I shot so many layouts, covers for Hustler, and immediately um, I was shooting for Clive. Then there was Jay Stephen Hicks. He shot me for Penthouse. And then a little while later, I would meet your mom, Suze Randall. I can't remember. I was trying to remember if I had actually, I think I had already done my first adult film when I met your mom. So it must have been a little while later. But in the beginning, I shot for Hustler and I shot for Chic. And um, they immediately started using me in all kinds of things. Um, I worked on a set with Marjo Gortner and... Um, they did a layout called, um, uh, what is it just escaped me. It was a layout with this woman on the cross and it was called, Oh my God. And we were on, at this table where we were all part of this last supper, but the, the girls, the models were all turned upside down. So we were kind of the feast with our legs open like that. So it was kind of like this huge controversial um, wow. layout. And at the time it was very shocking. And um, I remember the first time anybody from my hometown found out that I was doing nude magazines was one of my brothers. Uh, I had magazines and one of my brothers picked up one of the magazines in my family's living room I was like, oh, Hustler. And he starts looking and he opens the magazine and I was in it. And I was like sweating all of a sudden because you didn't recognize me. You couldn't yeah. even recognize me from like Lenny Allen, the girl from Orange County, who was like walking around in Vans tennis shoes to all of a sudden like this, you know, chic Hustler centerfold. And it took him a minute. I could see his face change. And then my brother was like, <laughs> threw the magazine down and said, I can't believe you would do something like that. And I remember right then I, I was like, well, you don't know about, you know, what we stand for in the adult entertainment industry. And you don't know what Larry Flint stands for. And and, and it's all about our First Amendment and freedom of speech. And I was trying to explain it to my brother. And, of course, not doing a very good job. It was all very new to me. But at that moment, I think I kind of realized that all of these things had begun to resonate with me. And I was very impressed with the Flints. I learned a lot from them. You know, Clive and I, we dated for just a minute or two, and then we became very best friends. And um, he shot me for all kinds of stuff. We traveled all over, went to South of France, and eventually he was the one that was behind me getting my Lifetime Achievement Award at the, at the Cannes Film Festival, which was one of the proudest moments in my career. So it was, it was great. Um, I think I was in the industry shooting for magazines for maybe a couple of years before I happened upon working in movies. And I never, I never thought I was going to work in movies. I didn't set out to do it. Um, the you know, the modeling was progressive. Um, with each and every photo shoot, you get a little more comfortable. Um, you're doing a little more. First, I had done a single girl, and then I got a centerfold. Then I was on the cover. You always wanted to get a cover with your centerfold because you got paid extra. You would get like $500 extra on top of the centerfold. Um, and then I started working with an agent. Now, the agent that I started with, his name was uh, Reb Sawith. And he was with Pretty Girl, an uh, agency called Pretty Girl. I don't know if you remember them, but. Um, oh, yeah. I interviewed. Yeah. yeah, I interviewed Jim South before he died. And we had a whole conversation about Reb and the rivalry between him and they Pretty Girl Entertainment. Okay. But now that you brought that up. Now, at the time, I didn't know it. 
but they had a huge rivalry. I was introduced to Reb by Bill Margold. I was introduced to Bill Margold almost immediately after like doing a few magazines and Bill Margold, the first time I walked into his office, um, I used to wear straight leg jeans. They were guest jeans and I used to wear pumps with them. And it seemed like really odd in that day that people, that a girl would wear pumps with her jeans. So I walked in the first time I met Bill Margold, um, he looked at me and he said, oh my God, I've never seen a woman wear pumps with, with, with jeans before. What the hell is the matter with you? And I was like, I do things the way I want to do them. <laughs> I don't take direction from others. And he looks at me and he goes, girl, you are going to be very, very famous in this industry if you choose to come into the industry. I was like, well, what the hell does that mean? You know, I'm already a magazine model. I don't need to do like movies or whatever. And they told me, you don't have to do anything that you don't want to do. So that made me feel like really comfortable. Um, I came in and I worked for, as you said, I worked for the rival agency. And I didn't even know that. I didn't meet Jim South and like everybody from Jim's agency until what would be sometime later. But they put me to work at Pretty Girl right away. And I was doing whatever it was I was comfortable with. Are you comfortable with uh, single girls? And I would do all this work. Um, then it was like, well, would you do a two-girl shoot simulated? And back then, we used to do magazine shoots where you were doing boy-girl or girl-girl. and you would simulate the set. So you would have to um, pose like you were having sex with the person, but you weren't actually having sex with them. So I remember doing a shoot with Tom Byron and this other girl um, for Hustler on a truck with, with Clive McLean out in, um, out in Palm Springs. And I remember like, sitting there and they're like, well, you have to get him, you know, play with this willy and get him hard for this scene. I was like, I'm not having sex with him. And they were like, yeah, but you have to, you know, you have to do it for the shoot. You know, you don't want, you know, him to have a soft. Yeah. Dad. Do you want to be here? Do you want to be here all day? <laughs> I'm kind of feeling like, am I allowed to, what am I allowed to say here? So I'll just say it and you can edit it. So he no, said, we don't, get him, we get don't, him a hard we don't on, have. girl. So I looked at him and I was like, and Tom was cute. Tom had this real little boy look, you know, and he was very shy. And when I was young, I used to have this thing in school about nerdy guys. And I used to love to like flirt with the nerdy guys, and like flip up my skirt, and act like, you know, because I knew they'd get all like bashful. And Tom was kind of like that. So I looked at Tom and I was like, okay. So I started playing with Tom, you know, and get him erect for the shoot. And um, I realized, you know, Clive said to me, he said, you know, if you don't take care of your talent, your co-talent, then your shoot is going to look like shit. And I learned very young about that, you know, that we had to work together as talent. Otherwise, my pictures wouldn't look good. And I didn't want that. So we're on the top of this truck and it's windy and we're out in the middle of Palm Springs. And we feel like every time I would stand up on the truck and we're talking about like a big rig, we're on a big rig having sex on top of a big rig. Wow. And Clive would be like, come on, get your ass up in the air and, you know, open that pink, show me that pink. And for Hustler, you had to show like big pink. Okay. Yeah. So that was progressive. And then I was doing a boy girl shoot and then I was doing a girl girl shoot and I had never been with a girl before. Um, but I remember like thinking, mm, this is kind of nice, you know, and then you do like the boy girl shoot. You'd be like, this doesn't bother me. This is fine. I'm working him, you know, I play with his willy and whatever. And then that was it. It was all done very professionally. Nobody was ever pushed. 
So you just get comfortable, you know, and you get to know each other. And they told me when I worked with them, you know, that Tom Byron is a big porn star. And I was like, him? He looks like a little boy. Tom <laughs> looked like a little boy. They were like, yeah, he's a, he's a well-known porn star. I had no idea. The agency that I worked for, Pretty Girl International, booked porn. And so I remember being in um, the office one day and in walks this tall guy and he was very gangly and geeky looking. And they said, do you know who that is? And I was like, no. And they said, that is the legendary John Holmes. And I was like, oh, oh my God, who's that? (laughs) (laughs) Who's that? And they go, oh, he's a really famous porn star. So I was like, I have no idea who he is. I'm not attracted. So it was really funny. So one day, he asked me, Reb said, uh, would you like to do some Playboy shoots? I don't know if you remember this, but you remember the Playboy shoots where you would do the simulated sex and we'd have to grind on each other and like make noise like we were having sex. And I did like, you know, the whole circle of shoots for them. So I'm like, well, why are we grinding on each other, but we're not actually having sex? Because you get on a set like that, and after grinding on somebody for an hour, you know, you're turned on. I mean, you can only grind your genitals so long, and they're going (laughs) to wake up and go, hey, feed me, mom. You know, I'm hungry. And they were like, no, we don't do that here. You can't show full frontal nudity. You had to cover it. I was like, God, this seems like a real waste of time. So one day he asked, do you want to go out on this go see? And um, the agent rub. And that was when I, I met Bobby Hollander. And I met Bobby Hollander. I had been doing like some shoots that were like um, hardcore shoots. I progressed to that. Did a few hardcore shoots for magazines. I was shooting for people like RBK. Um and uh, Clive McLean and uh, Stephen Hicks. And then it just progressed. It progressed from there. And um, I did a shoot that was one of the first shoots I ever did. It was called Vixens in Heat. And, you know, we were talking about, uh, I think Bill Margold was the one that booked it. We were trying to figure out, like, because the movies didn't release exactly as they were shot. So when we went back and we were working on my book, we were starting to put together like the catalog of how things rolled out. And we realized that there were some very, very early hardcore um, movie shoots that were done in me that were kind of like, I don't know if you'd call them loops, but they were just, you know, soft core shoots that kind of turned hard. So I did a movie that was called Vixens and Heat that was a very, very low budget um, uh, porn. And uh, they were like, well, I guess you'll do it. So I went on this uh, go see with Bobby Hollander. And Bobby Hollander was a very famous director at the time. He knew Shauna Grant. He had discovered a woman that was incredibly famous and popular at the time. Her name was Shauna Grant. And uh, I was very impressed by that. When I was at his house, there was like a whole thing that went on around that where I pulled up and he was abusing this French poodle in the front yard. And I've always been an animal rights activist lover since I was a kid. I've always been into animals. And I jumped out of my car. I had no idea he was the director I was meeting. And I said, what the hell are you doing to that dog? And it was a big, giant, like, imperial black poodle. And he said, it's my dog. You know, we had the words about it. He said, if you want the dog, you can have it. So I took the dog, put it in my car. Wow. I was going to take the dog because this guy was. And he said, who are you? Because I guess he had been sent pictures of me. And I had actually pulled on to his estate. And I was like, well, do you, and I looked around and at that moment I realized that was the director I was there to see. 
and I had just told him off about abusing his dog. And I had the dog in my car. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, what am I going to do now? So he goes, okay, now I know who you are. Get the dog out of the car. Come back in the house. We go back in the house. He had this beautiful estate in Tarzana that had this giant pool in the back. In the back of his house was a model who would later become one of my best friends for a long time in the industry. Her name was uh, Danielle Martin. And she was out there swimming in the pool. And there were some other models there, including uh, Shauna Grant. Her real name was Colleen. Um, who would come by and to see, you know, Bobby while he was, you know, looking me over to see if he wanted to use me in any of his projects. And um, he offered me some, a pipe and I thought it was uh, marijuana. It wasn't. So we wound up getting loaded and it was the first time I had ever done cocaine in my life. And uh, we wound up getting loaded and everybody was partying and all this stuff went on. And I stayed, we stayed up all night and I wound up on a porno set the next day. And um, I did a movie. I did a movie, but I kept looking at all of these girls going, look at these beautiful women. And nobody was ever forcing any of them to do anything they didn't want to do. And I kept saying, if they can do this, if they can be all of this, then so can I, mm -hmm. you know? And I already knew that none of what I had done so far was a problem for me. So I wound up shooting. Uh, I shot several movies for them. And it kind of all started from there. Wow. Sorry to be so long winded, but no, it's a, I mean, you know, it's a long the story is like, kind long of story. Long. so yeah. And, um, in the beginning, uh, with Bobby, you know, Bobby was kind of a Spengali. He was married to Gloria Leonard at the time and they were, uh, they had been married for some time. So when I met Bobby, I met all these people and I had already known all these people and everybody had already been talking about me because of, you know, the magazines and the shoots that I had been doing. So they had already had their eye kind of on that new girl, the new girl. So um, uh, that was sort of what happened with Bobby. Now, Bobby was kind of like a pushy guy. <laughs> hmm. Bobby was a pushy guy and I used to fight with him all the time. And, you know, he wanted me to, uh, he wanted to own my name. So he wanted me to use a name that I didn't want to use. And he kept trying to kind of put a lane on the end of my name. And I, Bill Margold was really the guy who had discovered me and brought me to Reb Sawitz. And Bill Margold said, you don't have to do or be anything that you don't want to be. So I said, well, this is, this is how it is. And this is what it is. And, I, you know, my name was Amber Lynn. And Bobby kept saying, why don't you use Amber Lane or Amber Lynn Lane? And what, how it turned out was Bobby really wanted to own my name and own everything I did and tell me what to do. And I, sorry, I'm just making sure that's set up right. Um, you know, it was Reb and Bill Markle that said, no, this is yeah. rare. She owns it. You know, she can do what she wants and not anything she doesn't. So that was, uh, that was that. That was great advice. Um, we have to take a quick commercial break, but when we come back, I want to kind of expand on that story about when you said the first time, um, that you smoked was at cocaine at, um, yeah. and, and where that led I'm you being kind of hesitant from. about it because I know. Yeah. Yeah. Basically we want to talk about your journey with addiction and sobriety because that's one of my favorite topics. Cause I've had a similar journey. So hang tight guys. We will be right back. Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Blue Chew. Blue Chew is making waves by bringing more confidence to the bedroom with their chewable tablets that will help you 
last longer, and stay stronger in bed. And the best thing about Blue Chew is you don't have to go to a doctor to get your prescription. It's all done online, discreetly in the privacy of your own home. That means you don't have to go and sit in an awkward appointment. You don't have to stand in line at the pharmacy. You will have a licensed technician who will find the perfect prescription strength for you, and you will have it shipped discreetly to your door. The process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com, and after you get approved by one of their licensed medical technicians, you will have your own supply of bluechew.com tablets shipped discreetly to your door. Does this sound too good to be true? Well, guess what? You can try it for free. Just pay $5 in shipping by going to bluechew.com and entering code HOLLY to get your first month subscription. Blue Chew is going to change your sex life by bringing you that added confidence in the bedroom that you've been missing. Hello, everybody. We are back with the one and only legendary Amber Lynn. So, Amber, um, one of your struggles in life I know I know has been with addiction and you've overcome that and you've been sober for a long time. And this is a topic that I really love to discuss because I think it's something that a lot of people in our industry struggle with. It's something that I definitely struggled with. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey and um how to. it led you to sobriety? I would love to. First of all, congratulations. I did not know that you were sober. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, but that was not my, I just mentioned that, you know, with Bobby Hollander was the first time I had ever smoked cocaine. It wasn't the first time I ever got high. I had been using, uh, marijuana, alcohol, and whatever else we could get our hands on in Orange County as kids. We did tons of stuff. Okay. All kinds of stuff. When I was kids, I tried LSD a lot a lot. We were rock and roll punk rock kids who were out for a great time. And we, I wanted to experience life. And I have that kind of personality where I was always attracted to the extremes, whether it was extreme music, extreme outfits, extreme everything. Loved it. Um, when I met Althea Flint, um, she was doing during that time, she was doing a thing for a magazine called, um, uh, I think it was called the rage or rave or something like that for hustler. And, um, I got into a car with them and went to the La Dome and I was, she introduced me to sting and, uh, the police. And I was totally impressed by that. And she was getting high. And I didn't use there. Um, but with Bobby Hollander, I did because we had always smoked pot out of a bong as a kid. And, you know, that was how we did it. Like the one hit bongs. And um, I, I had no idea that you could put cocaine in a bong. Or I probably already would have. But I had never done cocaine. We didn't have that kind of money. You know, that was like a rich man's drug. In the 80s, right. everybody tried cocaine. And often in the 80s, people freebased it. They smoked it. They smoked it because if you put it in your nose, your nose would run. And as a model, it was really important that you did not look loaded or messy mm. when you were working. And I didn't, I didn't get high when I was working, but the parties afterwards were vast. And, um, you know, I got high and it didn't, it wasn't about a thing for me. You know, it didn't, you know, it just, it was great. It was part of this grand facade that was going on in the eighties for everybody. Um, and I loved it. And, and I had a great time doing it. You know, I'm also a Virgo and I do have, oh, a my. Uh, you are, <laughs> uh, huh. Oh, so I have a very Virgo personality, which is that I am, I want things to look very proper and I'm, you know, how they look and everything is really important to me. So I never wanted to look messy or sloppy. So I would always really micromanage my partying and, you know, I would go out and um, do big events or whatever it was that was going on in the industry. We would show up and we would do ABN or great big events and I would stay clean and then I would go and 
we would all go party afterwards. We started when we were working on sets and stuff like that. Once we started partying and working on sets, um, you know, it was all of us. It was all of us. But what we would do is if, you know, the movie sets were run are run very professionally in the 80s. Um, when you go back there, we were working on big shows. We were on the biggest movies of the time. Um, and these were real directors that you had to audition for just like any studios. And I got to work with all of the biggest directors. And even back then, when I would use, I would get really out of body experience. You know, it would change my personality, the look of my face and how I felt and interacted with the world immediately. And, um, we were doing like AVN shows. And I remember one time, uh, we were doing a big show. Um, this is progressive as it's all starting to progress. I'm getting more and more famous. People are starting to recognize me out on the street. Um, I'm dating Jamie Gillis, who is an absolute legend in the adult business. We're getting all kinds of attention as a couple. And, you know, I'm, Jamie did not do drugs or party. And I was using with all my kind of younger friends at the time. Um, we were at a AVN and everybody was in my room. Um, we were staying, I think it was at the Sahara. Everybody was there. I don't want to name names out of school. Uh, but it was like the who's who of the adult industry. And at the time, um, I was under contract with Vidco, which was owned by Ruben Sternman, who was like the godfather of the industry. And Stephen Hirsch was just starting Vivid. And he had contracted Ginger Lynn as the Vivid new contract star, which was the first time it had ever occurred. They would have a booth that was Vidco's booth and Vivid would have half of the booth. Um, and they would put Ginger and I next to each other on two tables that were in the center of this giant convention center. So Ginger Lynn and I were side by side in the middle of the convention center and everybody kind of centered around us, you know, and all the fans would come in and they would line up all the way across the convention center to get their signature and their autograph with, with us. And they would go, you know, back and forth from her to me, me to her. We would stand together. They would stand in the middle. They take pictures with me, take pictures with her, whatever. Anyway, we would also come to the show together and we were, we had, we were treated like royalty. We were treated like royalty. We had limos. We had all we wanted in the rooms, open bars, anything you wanted, anything. So everybody would come to our rooms and party with us. And we often would have adjoining rooms. And so one of the times we all stayed up all night doing cocaine. And I mean, there must have been 20 of us from the industry, all the biggest names in adult. And it was about eight o'clock in the morning. Nobody had gone to bed and we looked at each other and said, what are we going to do? We have to be on the floor in like two hours. What are we going to do? And I looked and I, at, at this girl, her name was Susie Gunn. At the time she was Erica Boyer's girlfriend, but she knew everybody in the business. business. And I said, how about a bomb threat? And she goes, good idea. good idea, great idea. So we're all sitting there. She gets, I go, you do it. She gets on the phone, calls downstairs and calls in a bomb threat. <laughs> the floor. This is a true story. We're all sitting there. I don't even want to tell you somebody's still holding the mirror. We're all up there, right? All of a sudden, hang up the phone. We go, wow, do you think it worked? Do you think it worked? About five minutes later, the phone rings. It's like ring, 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 ring. I'm like, I'm not answering the phone. Ring, ring, <laughs> ring. Get the phone. All of a sudden, hello? You have 30 minutes 
to get downstairs, all of you on the floor, bomb threat my ass. And it was <laughs> like whoever was taking care of us. And I was like, shit, we're in trouble. We better go. Everybody in the room starts putting on my clothes. Just whatever's in the closet or ripping through the drawers. It's everybody. It's Sharon Mitchell. It's everybody. Everybody's in the room with us. And everybody starts putting on pieces of my wardrobe. We all go running down the stairs. We're stoned out of our minds. We're on the floor. We sit down. Me, Ginger, everybody. Ginger's got this fur coat on. <laughs> I don't know what. We're all like, we're here. We're here. And they look at us and they go, bomb threat, huh? And so it's a true story. Yeah. It was worth a try, man. <laughs> it was worth a try, thank God. Because, you know, in Vegas, it could have gone any way. We could have wound up in prison. They were like, no. Came right from my room, right down the, right down the. <laughs> Oh, that's so great. But this was the way this was the way it was. It was like it was like living in a fishbowl that was our own little world. And it was a completely different world because it was the adult industry. And back then, you know, while the industry was stigmatized, it wasn't as viciously stigmatized as I often experience it to be now. Um Years later, I would have to face my addiction, talking about what you're talking about now. Um, and it took me years uh, to kind of come to terms with that. Um, you know, in the year 2000, I got arrested and I got arrested because I was driving under the influence and um I had to face what, you know, what was going on with me. And I think that until you try to stop completely, you don't realize what has happened. And for me, um, it wasn't going hand in hand anymore. You know, by getting loaded, I was, um, I was doing a lot of things that were um, no longer working for me, let's say. You know, I wasn't showing up on jobs. I wasn't looking good. I was hanging out with people that were stealing money from me. And um, I had to go into rehab. And I did. And I su was successful. You know, I was court ordered, so it wasn't hard. <laughs> <laughs> but I did. Yeah, I a nudge from the judge, as they say. I got a nudge from the judge. But my nudge was, if you don't, um, come back sober if I see you again in this courtroom. And it was because the judge knew who I was mm. and they wanted to make an example of me. They knew I was a famous porn star. I was arrested in Ventura County, which was an absolute no, no back then. Mm. And they said, if you come back into this courtroom within two years, you will do every day of the two year sentence that's hanging over your head. And so I, I did, you know, I went into rehab and then I realized that I had a problem and I faced it and, um, I got clean and I've been clean April 19th. I will be 21 years sober. That's amazing. So 21, and it's been a long, long journey for me. Um, but I wouldn't change it for anything in the world. I'm so grateful of all of the things that I have achieved in my life my sobriety and my recovery are probably the things that are the most dear to me. And like you said, it's a journey and, um, you know, we just stay on the path one day at a time. What do you think the most valuable thing getting clean gave you? You know, you get on the road and you learn all these things as kind of a side, you know, you don't realize you don't go. <clears throat> I didn't get into recovery to get anything other than getting clean. And I was taught that from the very beginning. Um, I got sober with a lot of old school um, people from, you know, 12 step program and they didn't mess around when it came to that. You didn't, you came to be of service. You didn't come to get something. And, you know, I had been used to being this kind of famous, hot, 
you know, spoiled adult star. And that didn't work for me anymore. Um, I had to face my demons. It was an incredibly humbling experience. But I will tell you this. One of the great lessons I did learn was that, you know, a lot of people tried to convince me that I was in the position I was in as a result of the career I had chosen. And that because I was a porn star, I had become a degenerate addict. And that those two things go hand in hand. That was not my experience at the end of the day. It did take me time to really get to the core and learn the lesson. And I was willing to do whatever I had to do, whether it was never do porn again or, you know, do whatever I had to do. Um, but for me, I was able to get clean, get sober um, and go back into the industry and work again and do it completely sober. And it didn't trigger me um, any more than anything else did. I went on the road and I danced and I worked in bars and, you know, I just always saw everything as an opportunity to maybe be of service. And, you know, there's a lot of people as you get on the road that do need you. They need to get clean or they, they might need to hear a message. And, um, you know, that's, that's what I've learned. That was, my, that was like my great aha was knowing that you don't blame the adult industry for your uh, addictions. I think that I was attracted to the attention and the accolades because of the fact that I'm an addict, that that was why I was drawn to that. So do you believe, do you believe that you were born an addict or do you think that your life shaped you in that way? Or do you think maybe it was a little bit of both? Honestly, my story, I come from addiction. My father was a severe alcoholic. My father died of alcoholism and cirrhosis of the liver. Um, I think I faced the final demon and the final question the day that my brother um, passed away, which was probably the most heart wrenching and painful experience of my life. And the reason why, you know, my brother was Buck Adams and he was a very award winning, famous director who had his own career in the adult industry. He also was an addict and, um, you know, I tried to bring my sobriety to my brother and say, I know what's good for you and you need to do this because when you come from the family dynamic, he had grandchildren. I mean, he had grandchildren and they were my great, great nieces and nephews. And I wanted to say, you need to be there for the babies. This is not all about us anymore. And you need to get clean now. You need to stop this. And you know, that's not for me. That's not for me to say to anybody. It's not for me to determine whether you're an alcoholic or not. Um, but we try to do that sometimes with our family. And when my brother passed away, you know, I went to the hospital and we had been talking for a while because I had been, you know, trying to make him get sober for the kids. And he had, he had fallen off and he was struggling and, you know, he didn't want to, he didn't want to be around me because every time he saw me, I was like, when was the last time you were at a meeting or when was this? And I had to really learn that my recovery is very personal and I need to put the focus on me and not worry about what you're doing with your recovery and how you're working your program. When my brother passed away, I was in the room when he took his last breath. He was in my arms and I was, I had to make an amends to him. 
I had to make an amends to him because I did not allow him to be who he was. And the, I think the greatest respect and honor you can give anybody that you care about is to open your hands and say, you know, this is God's will, not my will. And I had to make an amends to him. And I realized there was no question, no question whatsoever from that moment on whether I was going to ever drink or use again because, you know, I saw, I saw what happens to us when we take our last breath. And it, it's a very, very painful thing. Oh my God. What, what an, an incredibly profound realization to come through and so heartbreaking. And I totally identify with that. You know, the heart, one of the hardest things is, is trying to take, you know, trying to, you can't take someone's journey away from them, you, can. you know, and, and it's so hard. What happens is, is that they're on this road and whoever their higher power is, has their sights on them. And there is going to be that moment of clarity that is only to us. It's very personal. And if you jump in front of that going, hey, stop, 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 stop the car. All of a sudden, they're not supposed to land here. They're supposed to land here. And there's an experience that occurs that is that moment of clarity. And whenever, like for me, I had my moment of clarity and I can always go back to that because there's always going to be moments where, you know, I say, God, I used to love to, you know, make a great dinner and like have these wonderful wines and all this stuff. I gave that up. I gave that up because in order to stay clean from the drugs, I had to give up the alcohol. And those were all very grown up and mature decisions from a girl who had lived a life that was, you know, anything I want in the way I want. So, you know, these were, these were profound. Like you said, they were very profound. Um, and also because I knew that, you know, his daughter, my, my niece was in the room with me and I saw the pain that it caused her to see her father, you know, lose his life. And he had, you know, heart failure with a stroke and his liver was failing. And that's what happens at the end is that your body just kind of implodes. It can't take anymore. And the doctor took me outside and he said, I said, my, my brother, he was, he was, he was a professional boxer. He's buck fucking Adams. He can live through this. And he looked at me and he said, your brother has a body inside. You know, my brother's running five miles a day. He said, he may look like that on the outside, but on the inside, he's like an 80 year old man right now. He's tired. He can't take anymore. So, you know, I, I had to say to him because he had a double stroke. And he wouldn't let go. And he was holding on to my arm and holding on to my arm. And they said, you know, we he's on like basically on life support. And I said, no, he's not. He's holding on to my arm. And they said um, that I needed to let him go. I needed to help him let go. And I had to go into that room and say, listen, your kids are going to be okay. Your grandkids are going to be okay. You can go now, Buck. You can go. And that's when he let go and he passed away in that room. And it was like of all the, the last thing you want to do is let go of somebody you love. And my brother was my hero. He had been in my world since the day I set foot on this earth. He was always there for me. He was every time I got into trouble, anytime I needed to know anything, anytime I bought a car, broke up with a guy, anything, drugs, alcohol, anything. But the one thing I did that my brother couldn't do was I got sober, but I stayed 
but I stayed because it was like by the grace of God, there go I. When I saw him pass away, I said, now I know what it means when they say that. So I got it, you know, but by the same token, I also got it in a way where I said, this is not the adult industry's fault. If you can't go to, if you're having a problem, you obviously don't want to go into a bar. If you also have sex addiction, that is part of your, um, your program, um, then you don't want to do things that are going to trigger that. But for me, um, I've been able to live and be clean and stay clean and sober and, um, and do it, you know, and work in the industry and have an emotionally clean and stable life. Yeah. And you're such a great example of that. And there's a lot of other people in the industry now who, you know, are open about their struggles with addiction who, yeah, same thing have been, you know, through addiction, have gotten sober and, and stay in the adult industry and are doing better than ever. Um, now that they're clean and sober and, uh, Seth Gamble is a great I example. Think now that they've opened up the door in the industry to be yeah. able to be more free about talking about your recovery and, and saying, you know, and by the way, I don't think any director wants to see, uh, a model or talent show up fucked up on their set. I mean, nobody mm-hmm. wants to try to shoot somebody who's got, you know, water dripping out of their nose or they're, you know, in the bathroom trying to do something. They don't, they don't want that. You know, mm-hmm. people see from the outside, you know, I often have faced people and conversations a lot in 12 step where they say, Oh, that industry is this and that. I say, well, Obviously, there are going to be your lower budget projects in any industry. But for the most part, our, this industry is a professional industry. And people want you to act professionally on it. They don't want you to show up all wrecked on drugs and try to shoot. That doesn't help them get you to do more or different things. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the most successful performers, you know, I mean, you can look at uh, people like Angela White, who I don't think like ever drinks, <laughs> you know, um, never does drugs. I mean, there's so many performers that are at the top of their you game. Know, they don't I ever absolutely adore her. I see her stuff out. I've never met her, but I did follow her on, um, social media and I congratulated her on her success because, you know, not always you see a performer, you see certain performers come along and you go, wow, she's going to be huge. And when I first started seeing her, I was like, wow, you're just, you're awesome. You're going to do so well. And I remembered that Bill had done that for me. You know, he Mm -hmm. said, girl, you're going to be really famous and you're going to do very well in this industry if you want to. And he was always one of those people, Bill Margold, who remained a mentor to me always, who, you know, if I needed to go talk to him, like shop talk about scenes, what it would be like to shoot something like a DP scene. I mean, who do you go to um, Mm -hmm. and say, you know, how do you do a DP or what does it feel like to do something like that? Back then, you couldn't do those kind of things. I mean, I was the girl who shot the first double vaginal. Oh, wow. Ever. And it was on The Devil and Miss Jones 3. And I don't know if I can say this, but it was Vanessa Del Rio's movie. And I was so honored. I got to work with the great legend, Vanessa Del Rio. And she was amazing. She was so amazing. And we were all on it. I was on it. Ginger Lynn was on it. uh, And so was Tracy Lords. And we were all competing because we wanted to, you know, do the best scene better than anybody else's and impress Vanessa. And I was working with, I can't remember who, I think it was, I think it was Al Brown and somebody else. But anyway, 
they were talking about doing a DP. I had never done one. And um, it slipped. It just happened. <laughs> the passion. And Vanessa was watching the scene and I was like, oh my God, keep going. And they go, are you okay? Are you okay? Because, you know, the director yeah. it was for Greg Dark and the Dark brothers were these famous directors and everybody wanted to shoot with them. And they were like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, it's fine. Keep going, keep going. And then it just became like this amazing over the top scene. You know, we do things in the business and you know, when you come across one of those scenes where you're working with some amazing director and you come to the set, I remember one of my friends, um, he's a mainstream actor and he was on my radio show and he was talking about what it was like to work with a really great director and have them let you off the leash. And I was like, when a director la lets you off the leash, it's when they trust you as talent to bring what you've got to the scene. And I said, wow, that's really amazing. That's exactly how you describe the adult business when we do sex scenes, because you can do all the acting blocking in the world. But when it comes down to the shooting of the sex, you have to let the passion in. You have to yeah. let the door swing open, let the realism in. And that's when, you know, a director lets you off the leash. And in this instant, we got this amazing scene. And I remember Vanessa saying afterwards, wow, that was amazing. She was, And I had impressed her. So I was like, oh, I impressed her. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah. I mean, like the sex is kind of the one thing that you can't really choreograph so much. So, you know, you just gotta, it's, I think when you, that, try, that's the one thing that's going to happen or not. It, and it, it shuts it down. I also believe that that's what makes legends in the industry for what mm. they call legends is for people who know their craft so well that they know how to go into a scene and bring enough of their acting and skill and be able to let go enough in a sex scene to be able to come out with right. everything you've got. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's a skill that not everybody has. So, and, uh, you do, and this is why you are a legend and Amber, thank you so much. Um, it's been such a pleasure to finally get to chat with you. I've been looking forward to this interview for a long time. Can you tell everybody where to find you online and also, um, just really quickly about your podcast and where people can find that? Absolutely. Um, I'm the host of Rock and Sexy Uncensored. You can find us direct link at rockandsexyuncensored.com. There are dashes all between it. And um, right now I'm in Las Vegas. I am from Los Angeles. So we're going back and forth with the pandemic and everything right now. Um, but you can direct access us at rockandsexyuncensored.com and you can follow us on social media at rockandsexyu. Um, also, I am available at triple X Amber Lens on Twitter and also amberlynn.rnsu on Instagram. You can basically find me anywhere. If you just Google me, I'm kind of all over the place. And I have a website, amberlynntriplex.com. That's where my hub, where you can find, you know, how to access me just about anywhere. Fantastic. Amber, thank you again. Really appreciate you, it. And you guys can find me online at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. If you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. For my Not Safe for Work website, uh, you can go to hollyrandall.com and appreciate you guys hanging out and listening to us. And I will see you next week. <laughs>